Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Littlest Petcast. I'm your host James and today we are going to be talking about the first episode in the series, Blythe's Big Adventure. And it starts out in this weird suburban neighborhood that just seems a bit creepy to me. It's like, uh, like have you ever seen the Cat in the Hat movie? It kind of reminds me of that neighborhood. You know, where lawns get mowed daily, twice daily if needed. Kind of feels like that. It's just weird to me. We then meet our main character who is sketching fashion under a tree. When a squirrel comes up to compliment her fashion. Okay, yeah, this is weird. I just just saying it out loud. Like, this is weird. Oh god, this is different than just typing it up or thinking it in your head. Oh god. Uh, we're not even past the... We're not even at the theme song yet and already I'm... Oh, whatever. You know what? Never mind. Let's just keep going. So, anyway, as I was saying, the squirrel comes up and compliments Blythe on her fashion sense. And, uh... And Blythe accepts the compliment tentatively because she doesn't know what the squirrel is saying and comments on that. Then a frisbee comes by, soon followed by a dog, and the dog is clearly aiming for the frisbee, but but our main character, Blythe, her name is Blythe, by the way, doesn't seem to get it right away. It takes her a second, and then she wishes... She knew what animals were saying. Now keep that in mind for later, because I'm going to talk about that later. But right now, you just need to know it's a wish. Not like, I wonder or I hope. No, just, I wish. Then suddenly, her dad comes along. I'm going to talk about her dad, too. Her dad is my favorite character in the entire show. <laughs> And says that they are moving because he got a promotion. And then the theme song happens. Now, okay, as far as theme songs go, it's not the worst. It's catchy. It's it's fine. I, I kind of enjoy it. It's not the best, but... And, you know, it's, it's fine. Anyway, so then uh, we find that they are moving to a New York City stand-in just called downtown city just downtown city i wonder how it got to use that name it's just i know it's dumb to complain about this but uh it kind of plays into something bigger with the show's problems in my opinion but for right now i want to talk about a different problem the show has uh, it's art now the art is, eh, it's like, it's not bad, actually. It's, it's just, it's strictly kids show, though. I want, well, okay, like, based on the example I'm about to use, it might not be strictly kids show, but it's just, like, well, it's pastel, obviously. I think it feels pastel to me. I don't know. It's just weird and pastel. I guess, but it also feels like it was animated on, like, construction paper. It it feels like it's a step above South Park, in a way. That's the example. Anyway, uh, yeah, it just feels like a step up uh, from, like, South Park's animation. But, like, South Park's animation is just trying to be that crass. This feels like it's trying, but it the whole thing just feels like it's on construction paper. Or it is construction paper, but it's all construction paper so that it just looks normal, but not normal. It's just weird to me. I don't know. I That is just something odd that like will persist throughout so i just wanted to get it out here because that's no there's no use in complaining about the art if it's just the same like this it's not bad for a kid's show but like it feels like it's pandering too much to kids 
Just a little bit. Anyway, Blythe begins to take us through how she's feeling about the move. And then we are formally introduced to her father, Roger. And this is also where we learn her name is Blythe. Now, Roger is excited about the move because he's also getting a promotion and, you know, likes moving. But Blythe is kind of eh on it a little bit. She's just down because it's so sudden. I've been, I've been there. I think a lot of kids have been there at some point in their lives. Okay, yeah, this is this is a point worth talking about, even though I don't have it in my in my notes. But like, there are times where the show feels actually relatable to some extent, where it's really down to earth and it's just. It just bears itself out there. And this is one of the more subtle examples of it, but there are some not so subtle examples as well. But I say it works well. Just, I don't know. Again, this plays into a bigger flaw with the show overall, though. But we're getting to that when we get to that. That was a weird sentence. Anyway. So then we are also introduced to the running gag of a character giving an acronym to something and then someone else asking what the acronym means and then the first person explaining the acronym. So, yeah, for instance, uh, in my notes I have typed out uh, A-R-C, then someone else would go like, A-R-C, then they'd be confused for a second, then go, A-R-C, what does that mean? Then I'd answer, acronym running gag, so. Now, okay, this running gag, again, is just okay. I mean, I don't find it terribly funny, but I find it charming to some extent that they're doing this. Like, I guess it's kind of... I I get it. I know because of the whole acronym thing with the texting. And I sound like I'm 50 right now, but I'm not. But it's just... I don't know. I don't find it that funny. Like, if you want to see a good example of people being confused by words, I would would suggest Ruby Gloom because they have this really funny running joke where someone would say something in a like in some form of jargon and then everyone would look confused and then they'd have to explain what they mean (laughs) but back on track anyway so uh after a pep talk from Blythe's dad about thinking like this is an adventure to just perk Blythe's spirits up uh Blythe starts sketching again in the back seat, and Roger cranks up the radio and starts driving uncontrollably to a point where it's disruptive enough for someone to yell at Roger, and at this point, Blythe notices that her father is driving wildly. I should have also mentioned earlier that Roger, Roger is a pilot, so, like, th- this makes it appear like he's not a good pilot, even though he just got a promotion, which, wow, now that I'm saying this out loud and thinking it out loud, is just really bad. <laughs> but anyway, so, it ends up that Roger lands on a truck truck, you know, one of those, like, things that they put cars on when they're like being transported en masse and then uh, they finish their ride and arrive at their new apartment which is above the titular Littlest Pet Shop. Blythe notices the pet shop and uh, Roger comments that they're actually not moving into the pet shop but rather onto the top floor. Now, as the movers start moving things, surprise, surprise, two twins just appear out of 
open air. This is another running gag. I will tell you that. Uh, okay. Wow. Uh, yeah, that I don't really like that running gag either. Uh, but onward. So these are the Biscuit Twins, the recurring antagonists of the show. If you can call them that. I don't know. They're kind of bumbling, but they're the closest thing to an antagonist that you can find in this. And they're pretty antagonistic as they meet Blythe. They insult her. They take her book of fashion designs that she did, insult them, and then offer to buy Blythe new clothes, which Blythe rejects because they were very rude by just taking something and then just trashing all over her. And then she, and then Blythe just exits into the building, but the Biscuit Twins appear there again. Uh, oh God, this is, this, again, this is just weird saying out loud. I don't mean to be tripping, but there's a lot of tripwires in this show when you get to talking about it. Anyway, so they appear in front of her in the building. Uh, and then just, like, go off on her, saying, Wow, you kind of suck because you said no to us. And then, like, they're kind of intimidating. And then Roger just is, like, making baby noises to the pets. Kind of embarrassing Blythe. And then the twins make some remark on how, like, the pet shop isn't going to be there for very long after. And then we transition to the apartment building where Blythe and Roger are unpacking. And then, uh, and then Roger and Blythe start talking about just the new adventure and the biscuit twins that Blythe ran into earlier and then like I don't know I I actually kind of like this scene because it like at this point we get to all of the reasons I love Roger Baxter because like he's goofy he's an embarrassing dad of a dad like he's the most dad ever but that also comes with him just being a good parent. He he's engaged in what Blythe thinks. He he's always trying to be supportive of her endeavors, and yet he's always cautious about her. So when they get to talking, Roger's wondering if she found new friends yet, but Blythe answers not quite cuz they're mean. And, like, th Blythe and Roger just have this, like, really cute back and forth about how, like, Roger also had Mean Girls back in her, his day. And then, you know, it's just, it's just this whole, uh, uh, I can't, I can't convey this scene. This, this one's just worth watching. Uh, I just, I just love Roger Baxter. <laughs> He's I'm I'm going to say it right now. Roger Baxter is my spirit animal. <laughs> anyway, so um then Blythe gets to start unpacking her room and then she takes out her guitar to unpack with a song. It is a brief song, I guess, cuz like she runs into the problem of like needing to open a window so she sees what she thinks is a window even though it's probably not where a window should be and then she pries it open and finds out it's a dumb waiter which is why it would not be where a window is because that would be a terrible place for a dumb waiter 
and also a ter and like where the dumbwaiter is is also a terrible place for a window. I don't I don't get why she confused it with a window. Oh god. <laughs> I just don't get it. So anyway, Blythe being adventurous as she has found herself to be this in this new moving situation decides to ride down the dumbwaiter and just she just goes in and starts lowering herself down when she sees a spider and gets freaked out just a little bit and then let's go of the rope does the cartoon look away at the at the screen goes uh oh and then falls like it's some fucking wily e. coyote cartoon <laughs> Uh. <laughs> right, so she falls, and then, then she gets to the bottom floor, gets out of the dumbwaiter, and there's just a bunch of smoke around, which is also weird now that I'm saying it out loud. That that's the running thing for this podcast. Just realizing how much of this is weirder than I thought, just by saying it out loud. Anyway, but there's a bunch of just smoke, and then there's just some mysterious voices just wondering if she's alright. And then the smoke clears, and we find that the mysterious voices belong to animals. Now, Blythe is understandably shocked that she can talk to animals now. And that animals can talk to her. And okay, yeah, not now I'm going back to the whole wish thing. Cause remember, earlier she wished she could understand animals, but then there's also the fall that happened. Now, this this offers two different explanations as to why she can talk to animals is it because she wished on something to make her talk to animals or is it because she fell down a dumbwaiter and then just like hit her head somehow to allow her to talk to animals this is just this is confusing and i don't get why they did this (laughs) i could believe either at this point because I'm already suspending my belief that someone can talk to animals in the first place. I don't get it. Why is this a thing? Uh, and the worst part is we won't find out for another three seasons. I just, I don't get why they offer these two, th- like why just keep us wondering like, why not just give us one explanation now and then just come up with a different one when you're ready to expand on it further or disprove the original theory? Why Why have two? I mean, I guess it's just to keep us in suspense, but three seasons is a long time to keep us in suspense. And even then, there's an episode before we find out why that just disregards the reason why it's just i will i will get to those episodes in the future but uh anyway that's that's enough of this rant so blythe introduces herself to the pets and they make this terrible stuttering joke where she's like just shocked and goes blythe and then the animals respond with hi or whatever so then um, (coughs) we get to our first song of the series even though there's the theme song and the brief room unpacking song from earlier but this is like the first song proper that just introduces the ensemble cast of animals and where we get to learn about them And uh, I will take this time to just talk about the songs and a few other things, I guess. But the songs are all 
composed by in some way by Daniel Ingram, who also does the music for uh, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. Now, that means that these songs are good. They're good. You know, they're they're fine songs. They're they're well composed, you know. But the difference is that the songs in MLP feel consistent. The songs in Littlest Pet Shop don't. And that will be more expanded on in future episodes, but for right now, like this song, it's a fine song. It introduces the cast of animals. Zoe, who's a singing, fashion-obsessed dog. Pepper, who is a comedian skunk. Um, Finny, who is a dancing lizard who's not terribly bright. There's Minka, who's an artistic monkey who's just kind of just all over the place. Sunil uh, is a mongoose who's kind of scared and a magician. Russell is an uptight hedgehog and then Penny Ling is a sweet panda who does the um, the weird I don't I don't know what it's called is it, it's like a weird flag dance kind of thing but not with like flags but with like ribbons it's more of a ribbon dance I guess but whatever like if you if you watch it you'll know what I mean but anyway yeah so those are the the pets that they introduced through this pretty good song it's it's catchy it's a good song probably the longest song in the in the show maybe but you know it's a good catchy song and I guess it it uh, the song should set the tone for other songs in the future but it kind of doesn't as we've just discussed but anyway uh after that musical display Blythe runs out of the pet shop well, out of the pet area to run into the pet shop owner, Mrs. Twombly, who's the accent, who's eccentric. She's the eccentric owner of Littlest Pet Shop. And Blythe tries to tell Mrs. Twombly about what just happened, but Miss Twombly just kind of brushes her off a little bit and just goes more into her uh, eccentric tendencies. And claims that, uh, like, weird things can happen in this pet shop. And then a noise is made. And then Blythe gets freaked out and just runs out. But then Miss Stromley notes that it was just the air conditioner, which... I mean, I don't know why that's funny. Or how that's supposed to be funny. So... As Blythe runs out of the pet shop, for real this time, she runs into someone walking their chihuahua, and then Blythe is still kind of freaking out and probably a little in denial. But then, like, the chihuahua talks to her and says that, and says, I like you, you crazy, and then just runs off again. Anyway, so the next scene is just someone named Christy running, uh, walking into Little's Pet Shop while talking with multiple people on multiple phones. And then she's here because she notices that the Little's Pet Shop is going out of business and wants to open up her own shop in the area. So after she gets off her phones, uh... She begins discussing with Mrs. Twombly and like the pets are just kind of freaking out because they love the Little's Pet Shop. But back at the at the talking, there's this 
line and this whole scene in general, but this line in specific, this line specifically is just where I want to just begin to address like an issue I've been talking about, but not really talking about. And that is that Mrs. Twombly does not like to make business decisions, quote, on odd numbered days and even numbered months, end quote. Now, on its own, that's a pretty funny line just because of how odd it is. But that's the whole thing about this show. This is just a very odd show. Like, and it's just like, that's that's where a lot of the problems come in. Like, it's very odd, but it's also very down to earth at some times. It, it doesn't take itself seriously at some parts, and it takes itself seriously at other parts. Like with the whole going out of business thing, but then we have this scene where just someone has just like three phones going off at a time. And then just Mrs. Tromley being eccentric about her business making decisions. And like this whole this whole thing just comes off as really jarring between the two sides. Like it to put it into like the best terms I know how to put it in, like this entire show just feels like a combination of two very good shows, but just like in a way that they don't mix quite right. The two shows being once again, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic because they share a lot of the same voice actors, maybe some of the same writers, the same song composer. Uh, did I say voice actors already? But also the same channel. And it's just like all the like serious, more down-to-earth stuff. Like It's still jokey, but more serious, like more coherent, cohesive aspects of the show feel like it takes inspiration from that and then there's and the weird just weird stuff comes from Phineas and Ferb it's just because Phineas and Ferb is just a show that's just weird for the sake of being weird it's just it doesn't need to explain itself because if it does that would ruin it this feels like it's just Phineas and Ferb just like Littlest Pet Shop feels like it's Phineas and Ferb if it were trying to explain itself verse or my little pony if it weren't trying to explain itself so yeah that's why i feel like it's a mixture of both that just doesn't mesh well you know it's just it's this weird weird feeling that this show has i i don't know how to explain it better but maybe someone else can in the comments or reviews or whatever well, back on task. Uh, so after that conversation, the pets discuss a solution as to how to save the littlest pet shop from being closed. And then um, Penny Ling says they should ask Blythe, but everyone ignores her in a, another drawn-out joke that I don't think is that funny. It's kind of mean, actually, but... Eh. Whatever. So the next day, Blythe wakes up and, uh, like, finds that the animals are in her room making a mess of things and pleading for Blythe to save the pet shop. But, uh, like, Blythe is a little on the fence... But she eventually accepts. After hearing about the main form of competition, the largest ever pet shop, which the pets complain that they don't get to spend any time together, the squeaker toys don't squeak, and the third thing I kind of forgot at this point in the recording, because it's been a while and stuff. And also they give, like, the, you know, the standard puppy dog eyes, even though only one of them is a puppy dog. But, I mean, you get what I mean. So, uh, yeah, like I said, Blythe agrees. And then they tell, and then the pets tell her she has to do it by tomorrow. And then Blythe and Shock again lets go of the rope, sending the pets flying down. 
the dumbwaiter, which which is how they came up to Blythe's room in the first place, which you know, come to think of it, I never questioned this before, but why why is there a dumbwaiter that goes from the shop to Blythe's room? They never really explain that. Whatever, so the pets drop down and then Blythe apologizes and then she's like and then the pets are like it's fine and that's the end of part one now part two begins with Blythe getting in the car for her dad to take her to school meanwhile the pets are cheering on Blythe because she is their last hope to save Littlest Pet Shop. And uh, Blythe does not want her dad to know that, notice that. Because they, they made signs of Blythe even after she changed out of her pajamas into the attire she's wearing right now. Which, I mean, I guess is kind of like a throwaway, but... It's still something I noticed. I don't know. It's just, it's just weird. So anyway, in uh, in Blythe's attempt to get Roger to not notice, she just blinds him and with his hat and just punches the gas and makes Roger drive recklessly again. And this is something I noticed this time watching it. Yeah, I've watched this multiple times. This is why I decided to do the podcast. Because there's just so much to talk about at any given episode. As I am finding out. Even an episode I consider to be on the better end of the spectrum. Like this one. Because, <laughs> wow. Anyway. And it turns out that in the Mad Fury... They run into the same guy from yesterday that was like, Hey, watch where you going. And he's doing the, Hey, watch where you going again. Or thing. Again. But anyway, so they arrive at school and Blythe just walks out. Meanwhile, the Biscuit Twins walk out of their limo with their dad behind a newspaper. And their dad is like, Try not to get expelled. I have no expectations of you. Just just go. And they go. And we can see on the license plate of this limo, it says the largest ever pet shop. <laughs> After that, we cut back to the pet shop and the pets try to figure out a way for Blythe to save the pet shop, even though they asked Blythe to come up with a way Wow, I am just learning so much about this show just by talking about it. But anyway, so what happens instead is just the pets just boast their talents except for Russell who just who's just trying to organize everything. But anyway, back at school, Blythe is having trouble opening up her locker when she meets three new human friends jasper sue and young me and like they they talk a bit and they introduce themselves and blythe informs them that littlest pet shop is closing and you know they liked it but it's still closing and they also uh talk about the biscuit twins for a little bit because as jasper says at that part they're unofficially officially the mean girls of the school and also that their dad owns the largest ever pet shop so anyway it cuts to lunch where the three of them have invited Blythe to sit at their table and Blythe again discusses the littlest pet shop and almost lets it slip that she can talk to animals but doesn't and then the biscuit twins come and again insult her drawings again try to be friends with Blythe and Blythe again says no and they're just really mad at this time and just go off on her again 
and just say, you'll never be able to save the littlest pet shop. And then Jasper comments that they are now officially, officially the mean girls of the school. But then inspiration strikes Blythe as one of her drawings lands on the ground and she sees Zoe's face on it and just comes up with the idea of a pet fashion show, which, I mean, we'll get into later because that's when it's revealed, but whatever. But back in order of things, there's this just like really weird sequence that comes out of nowhere of like the pets walking through a field of flowers into the littlest pet shop only for it to be revealed that it's the largest ever pet shop and Miss Twombly has been replaced by again the Biscuit Twins but after the pets are shaken out of that fantasy and back into reality Blythe comes running into the store presenting an idea to Mrs. Twombly and the pets can't understand them because they're being blocked by a wall of glass even though they just opened the door last time to hear that the little pet shop was closing but whatever you know we'll we'll go with these things i'm 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 used to at this point in recording because most of them can't hear zoe shows off the fact that she's a dog and can hear stuff and provides a translation even though she mixes it up at the beginning and even though like blythe says she has a surefire way to save the pet shop she translates it out as Blythe is sure to set fire to the pet shop which is amusing in delivery and my delivery was a bit you know not on the side of a professional voice actor but you know I thought it was it's an okay joke it's not it's not terrible I like it but then she gets to an actual translation and this is where uh, the whole pet fashion show comes in where she designs clothes for all the animals and, you know, uh, has them show off in a modeling show. And uh, Mrs. Twombly agrees to the idea because, you know, it it saves her shop. Her, it salvages her way of life. You know? So anyway, Blythe sets up her room to prepare for the show by making the outfits and having the pets train for the runway in a montage of you know setting it up and and at this point i would like to come back to just how and why pets have an inherent sense of fashion in this universe it just seems weird to me. Again, this is this falls into like the sometimes it explains itself, sometimes it doesn't, and this is just an area where it doesn't explain itself, where it kind of needs to. I mean, I like if it was all just it didn't need to explain itself, then sure, whatever, pets have a sense of fashion, but like Sometimes it does explain itself, and it's just, I don't know, it need it needs to go one way or the other on this, and it's just torn in the middle, again. It's just that problem, again, in a, in a new angle. After she sets everything up, Blythe goes around hanging posters all over town with the pets, and even hangs a bunch of them on the largest ever pet shop, which takes a lot of guts. Although she just might be new and not know that that was just largest ever pet shop and just think it was like, like whatever this universe's equivalent of a Walmart is. It is that big. I mean, it is the largest ever pet shop. So it's either gutsy or stupid. Maybe a little of both. But anyway, because it's on the largest ever pet shop, the Biscuit Twins see this and just start out to sabotage Blythe. So the night 
comes and the fashion show is about to begin when uh like Blythe's human friends burst in saying that all of the posters were covered in a note that says come get free money <laughs> I'm sorry, that just, that, that one's, that's just funny. That's just funny. <laughs> it's just so, oh, God. Th this is, th this is one of those times where just, like, being more like Phineas and Ferb helps it, because that's, that's something I would expect out of Phineas and Ferb, just, like, something that blatant and just... <laughs> Oh, God. So anyway, they figure out that the Biscuits just did this. And uh, Mrs. Tromley goes out to apologize after Blythe offers to apologize. And then we s transition to the stage where audience members are just clamoring for the free money. And in the shadows lurk the Biscuit Twins wearing cat suits to be undercover in a pet thing. Let's move on. So the Biscuits discuss their plan of uh, embarrassing Blythe by sneaking up to the rafters and dumping kitty litter and chocolate pudding on her when she goes out to take a curtain call, which they might not have done if everyone had left after the promise of free money was void so whatever they're not the they, like i said they're not the brightest bunch but they're antagonistic all the same so anyway someone walks by and they get to test their disguises by pretending to be cats and surprisingly enough the human doesn't notice that they're not cats but the dog that she's walking does I don't I don't know what to say at that point so anyway yeah like I said earlier like Mrs. Tromley goes out to apologize, and Blythe is still nervous about the whole thing. But then her human friends support her, say, you know, you can do this, this is great. And then Blythe, again, almost lets it slip that she can talk to animals. So, the pet show begins, the pet fashion show begins, and, uh... Like, the pets walk out in their fashions, which, I mean, the fashions look good. They look good. They're fine. That's that's not the problem of any of this. And, uh, you know, they they have some delightful things. There's, like, Zoe, Zoe's just walking out, but then there's Pepper being a comedian, and then there's Minka being a painter. And then Vinny coming out just like Michael Jackson and even playing like a uh, Michael Jackson-ish riff. You know, it it kind of feels like a Michael Jackson song. But then as the Biscuits go to the rafters with their kitty litter and pudding, Russell notices and goes up to try and stop it and figure out what it is so after the after the pets finish mrs Twombly suggests that blythe take a curtain call and she does and that's when the biscuits begin to strike however russell being a hedgehog having that hedgehog ability to just roll around at the speed of sound rolls up to surprise the biscuits and the biscuits fall instead of their buckets and Russell holds the buckets up so that they don't crash to their death and the biscuits are just embarrassed and not dead 
But then, after some silence, uh, Russell lets go of the buckets and the kitty litter and putting land on their heads. Which, I would like to note, it is just a little weird that a hedgehog, a little hedgehog, can hold up two preteen girls. Like, I mean, there's a lot of... No, there's not a lot of science on that. There's just... That's just a little weird. There's no... Lev there's no leverage of any kind. It's just... The biscuits, the buckets, and Russell. And Russell's apparently ripped enough to just hold them. <laughs> it's just weird. So, uh... Because of the fashion show, Littlest Pet Shop is revitalized and busier than ever and uh because it's busier than ever mrs trombley asks blythe to work for her which blythe immediately accepts and blythe and the pets have a touching moment of i love of blythe saying i love that i came to this town i got to meet you guys i got to meet my three human friends I got to experience something that I haven't experienced before and it's all because I fell down a dumbwaiter it's not exactly in those terms but it's the sentiment and uh, that ends part two of the first episode of Littlest Pet Shop Blythe's Big Adventure Join me next week when we go over the next episode, Bad Hair Day. This has been the Littlest Pet Cast. Thank you for listening.